Hi, everyone. It's Mary Larson, the Executive Director of the NAN Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us for this, the very first uh, session that we're doing on this very important topic, music and social justice. Uh, we invite you to please put your name and where you're, where you're uh, joining us from in the chat so we get a sense of the folks that are gathering with us today. Um, I'm so grateful that uh, you've joined us and uh, we've got a wonderful group of speakers that will be helping us and we'll also be going into uh, breakouts where we get to hear from you and hear uh, how you are also addressing this important topic. Um, those of you who join us regularly at our NAM webinars, we always have to pass through a bit of an antitrust reminder. This is something NAM does take very seriously in terms of our events and those that gather together do not uh, share competitive pricing information. NAM's detailed information on our antitrust policy is available to you and to anyone at NAM.org. So we invite you to consider that and, and thank you for understanding your attention. So today's topic, music and social justice. We're so uh, very grateful to have with us this remarkable panel of uh, folks that will be helping us discuss and share and learn more about this important topic. Uh, Habib Bakouf, the Director of Community Building Independent Sector, which will learn more about this vital uh, national international organization that unites nonprofit service organizations all around the world, a wonderful partner of NAMS. And we have a real pretty remarkable line above our NAM members, Crystal Morris, CEO of Gator Cases, Dee Dee Hyde, Executive Vice President Hyde Music, and uh, the, the wonderful women who participated in the very first SWIM Leadership Forum, and forum also, have, also have very important positions within the industry. Kit Culpepper from Yamaha, uh, CF Martin, and Lisa McDonald from Yamaha. So we're we're so grateful that they'll join us. So we want to jump right into our conversation with Habib. Habib, good morning to you or good afternoon wherever you are. Good afternoon, Mary, and thank you for having me on. Very honored and um, thanks for everyone on the call as well. I hope you're doing well this Friday. Yes, thank you so much. It's an important way to spend a, spend a Friday. You know, as we were looking at our programming for the NAM Foundation and we were considering how we could uh, take this time when we're all meeting in a very new and different format and a context. Uh, and when we made our plans that we were not gonna be meeting at NAM in January. Um, and quite frankly, we looked around us and we realized the uh, many of the current realities in our communities, in our culture, in our nation, um, and um, also our personal and community impacts relative to Black Lives Matter. Uh, that we are in a time of demonstration and civic unrest. And we also lost one of our champions this last year, uh, Congressman uh, John Lewis, who was a very close friend of NAMS. And uh, so we were on a journey to have deeper understanding and, and commitment. Um, so we have uh, created the music and social justice programming that we're gonna be sharing every month as we move forward and then also convene around this topic at our January Believe in Music event. So we really um, are uh, very grateful to all of you to joining us and we want to share together uh, this conversation of music and social justice. So Habib, giving that as a context, um, we'd love to hear a little bit more, learn a little bit more about who you are what your work is at independent sector, and maybe what, uh, what was a pivotal moment that brought you to this community work that you are helping us with? Well, thanks, Mary. Um, um, very important question. And um, I think I'll start about who I am as a person and how I got to this role and then connect to how I got to work in the independent sector. Um, I'm Habib Bako, I have been at the independent sector for nine years. And um, I think what got me to the work of social justice um, um, is purpose. You know, I was trying to find, and it's trying to find what my role was in civil society, what my role was in community and how I was civically participating in the public square and how I was being accountable to that it required some amount of growth. It required um, the constant um, self introspection of what am I doing and who's gonna do it for me? And it, it got to a point where I realized that the purpose itself to me was um, loving and loving deeply. 
you know, that um, the cries of the poor, the, the, the cries of our allies, the folks that are in the margins, um, the women that can access leadership roles, um, the folks in the disability space that are usually not in conversations like this, that what, how does Habib show up and how is Habib being accountable to making sure that I'm driving change? And it's the moment that I found and that kind of settled with me, I realized that the work that I had to do was my work. It was me driving the work and just aligned myself with institutions that held those values and talk to institutions that didn't hold those values about why, because it's the work of love. And so in doing that, independent sector itself is charged with um, holding civil society as a whole. It's the only organization that represents both charities, nonprofits, and corporate giving programs with the results of all people thriving. So when I show up to work, I'm showing up as myself. When I'm here in this conversation, Mary, I'm showing as myself in that I'm trying to get into relationship with you and everyone on this call around all people thriving. So that's you know, kind of the work I do. You know, I think maybe there's some echoes there for some of us, you know, you're, that you had some very, very deep feelings, right, for the needs of other people. Right, and I think that um, that is. I I know within our community of NAM members and our NAM associates and the great work that I think we're we're touching something here that is really important. Uh, that you've made your life work. Right, it was a really a motivation to you. Where do I go in the? Uh, we call it the public square or arena. Where do I go to actually do something? to make the things that I'm really concerned about and the opportunity for people. Uh, and I think uh, folks that are joining us here, I'm seeing so many familiar names and it's welcome to all of you. It's just lovely to have you here. Um, all of you can define your kind of your public square, be it a company or an organization or uh, a community with its, web, with its webs and its networks. Um, and uh, so when we say that, it's not, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean Washington or running for state legislature, or though it could, um, but um, could you maybe uh, follow up a little, a little bit with that, um, Habib? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, for those who are history nerds or that go back into the books, I mean, change comes from the community and it comes from the collective. So whatever you define as the public square is, to me, is around where are you participating civically and where are you um, holding love, how are you participating around all the other things that we're gonna talk around that um, interlay with social justice, but that's what your public square is. It's how are you showing up and how are you being um, a, a CEO of that role? I know we were gonna talk about formal authority later, but what is your personal authority in your community and how are you making change and how are your values aligned in making that change? I think it's very important for our civic health. So Habib, um, thank you for help, helping us set the stage a bit. But you know, I, I wanna get right to what we've decided to be um, a, a fearless and humble question, right? We fight, we've decided that that's the tone that we're gonna address our music and social justice uh, and so I ask a question, a two-part question with, with that fearlessness and also with great humility. Why are conversations about race and opportunity so difficult? Uh, and what is needed to start and advance these conversations? And when we uh, talk you know, race, race and opportunity, I know with institutions and organizations, many times there's almost a knee-jerk reaction says, oh, but we're doing this. There's a very kind of defensive posture and immediately need to describe, oh, this is what we're doing. But again, we, we, how do we go deeper and why are these conversations uh, difficult and what do we need to do to advance these conversations? Thanks, Mary, for um, the invitation for a very um, fearless conversation. And I would also challenge everyone on the call that this is to model the conversation that Mary and I will have, because I think that's the way to a better future. And Mary, I think the start of to start off is that it's uncomfortable. You know, in many of our institutions now and our communities, words like racism, white supremacy, feminism, sexism are shied away. Like people still don't even talk about it. They don't talk about the power that it holds. They don't talk about. They would either talk about systems, talk about coalition building talk about power building, 
talk about power sharing, which we'll talk about later, but they wouldn't name it for what it is because it's uncomfortable. And it also denotes this, this fear, you know, fear of saying the wrong thing, saying or be, fear of being other in the process of communicating like we're talking right now, fear of being deemed as someone that is an, an ally. There is also the history that all those words, the isn't told, and that people either through a, a gap in knowledge or that are just trashing into the movement right now, may feel worried about like, am I stepping in the wrong toes? What, am I, what should I be saying? And it creates paralysis. Then there's also um, um, just the ability of starting from within, because it starts with self. It's, it's more about what do I think is right and when shall I act? And that piece, that piece of analysis is where usually people get stuck in the conversation. And then there's also understanding that it's okay to be wrong. In the wrong, you learn, you know, and it's okay to be, to, 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 to be curious. It's okay, I don't know the majority of stuff that um, other communities are dealing with, um, quite frankly, Mary, but I care to know, and I want what's good for them. And that's usually the essence of how you enter into conversations. I think it's around value. It's around um, the purpose. It's around your personal drive as opposed to the complex words where we power building, strategy, reinvention. And those things are just um, um, frameworks that we create to avoid the real conversation that only makes it harder when we are catching up to the moments as we are seeing in our nation, as we are seeing play out in Louisville. Like those, those words don't align to what's happening in our streets. So it's like, you either just have to have the conversation and be okay with um, pivoting if it doesn't go the way you would expect it to go. So, so let's say you, you reference the, 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 the troubling and tragic actions happening in Louisville really as we speak, right? It's important for us to be present to the concerns of the time. Let's say someone had a company, an organization, and, uh, and, and to invite, let's say, an informal conversation with employees about what is happening. Would, is, is this part of the uncomfortable conversation? And, and uh, you know, would this be a moment of opening or a moment to you know, invite more people to have this, which could be felt that it, as, if, as an uncomfortable conversation? Uh, and just to invite people to share and invite people knowing that in the space of your organization, these conversations could be shared without without uh, kind of judgment or um, you know people being it, it would take a while I think but what's your thought about that yeah and you do reference a, um, a point around pace but uh, I think the invitation is less as important than the results you want to see because I think that uh, the invitation for a company in Louisville is less around let's talk about what's happening today and it's more about what's happening in our community the invitation is also what are the people we are serving in Louisville? We should have happened already, that conversation. So it's starting, what are we serving in Louisville? How are they being impacted right now? So how do we change and how do we pivot as opposed to just an invitation that seems surface level around just one event? So it's how do we turn events to processes? How do we take events and turn them into movements and shift in that movement, I think? so. So to answer your question, Mary, I think a conversation is always needed. I think the results need to be clear in the conversation. Right. I guess I'm driving at what we're going to be talking about throughout this entire uh, time together in our next series is um, you know, by creating uh, in an organization where these conversations can occur. Right. Absolutely. I think there are there are sometimes feelings that we, we go to our business or our organization and the, these activities or events in the world uh, are kind of separated from the place where we spend uh, so much of our time with the people that we spend so much of our time with, right? Uh, that's absolutely, the, the place that your organization is, is based as your community and the conversations you have at home, you should be having them at work because quite frankly, um, those values are not disconnected. And we are seeing it more and more that as much as we ignore 
um, that this is where you work and this is where you live, there's some convergence. It's all the same space and it's civil society. You know, you need a, uh, we are all charged with um, upholding the values and the health of civil society, both at work and at home. So to your point, Mary, I think that you, all organizations should be figuring it out now to create a space for these conversations and they are hard, they are um, painful, they would take time, but they are necessary. And I think organizations like the independent sector are helping organizations have, uh, have these conversations. I will let you do a plug for your conference. Uh. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, and it goes back to the question you had earlier around events. So when um, the unfortunate George Floyd incident that happened in Minneapolis, we had a, because uh, part of my role is designing an annual conference. So we had um, a reckoning time that, uh, you know, as much as all the other themes that we usually have in conferences, be it uh, acceleration, innovation, um, that the one thing that we should all focus on right now is anti-racism. And I would say um, from a professional standpoint that um, focusing on anti-racism and COVID recovery from a narrow lens has probably been one of the most rewarding things and experiences because a lot of all the other work now makes sense. You know, if all of the things that you do are around seeing a better world, it's really helped us in a way in both see our contribution and results and see the gaps and how much work we still need to do. So we, we do have an event coming up in October 14 and 16, and it's around having these conversations that Mary and I are having, as well as listening to other thought leaders in their space and just um, being in community with change makers. That's wonderful. So we want to use our last time here together, Abib. Um, we, in our warm up and getting to know each other a little bit, um, I love the, the things that you were teaching me, and you really did uh, teach me some important things. Um, it's defining the language of inclusion, right? Uh, and what, um, and kind of the, you know, if we, let's say an organization said, this month we're going to, this quarter we're going to focus on inclusion and equity, right? And they, you know, they get that manual that they got at a conference and they say, we're going to do this and this and this and this and this, right? So all of a sudden they can say to their customers or put on their, uh, you know, their website, we have these policies and we are a, a, an inclusive organization. Um, but there's something deeper that needs to happen, right? And that's what you were uh, talking about. I'd love you to share that with everyone. Um, you know, how do we really do this work? So I think, and I'll try to um, try to scaffold it. I think it starts with um, love, loving deeply, loving, infusing love, and using love as action. You know, and and this is love, including anger, which is an emotional um, showing of love. How do you channel love, anger, frustration, anxiety towards change? I think that's the starting, and it starts with self. You know, it's, it's what is the world you want to see? How am I showing up and how am I showing towards the results? There's ob obviously leadership matters and courageous leadership matters during this time. So um, there needs to be a signal from leaders in organizations that are holding power from either power sharing and getting out of the way and creating space for others that have not been in those roles. That's one of the things or creating voice voices that are not usually in conversation. You know, there's this whole thing about transformation versus implementation, where I, I think when we go down the route of implementation, that's where you end up with 20 years later and the first time you get a, let's say a woman on the board, a woman in leadership. Like it doesn't take you 20 years. It shouldn't take you that long to implement you know, transformation is around shifting power, just kind of like what happened in the past couple of months. We got hit with a virus and we are all virtual now. We pivoted this fast. Society just whoop, and we're all here now having this conversation. How, what if we transform that way and you had more women in leadership roles? And I know the leaders would swim are gonna talk a little bit about their experience, but that's one of the, the, the things that I just wanted to highlight that. In implementation, there's pace, but there's also urgency, you know, and it shouldn't be those five pages frameworks and which I call technical um, solutions. Technical solutions are 
the equity committee that's in your organization that has to come up with a six year plan. It is the, um, now before every meeting you do this, it's the, it's those four systems that are in organizations that make you address equity. We need that. But we also need the adaptive change, which is that the change that happens within, where we realize ourselves that in the technical piece, the CEO needs to somehow step into this work. But in the adaptive piece, I am a CEO as well of my life. I'm the chief equity officer in my community. And in doing that, here's how I'm showing equity and here are the values I'm driving and here I'm showing up. So it's accountability from the top, but it's accountability in itself. Because the structures that are in that are technical, that are the frameworks, if you do not have those adaptive pieces in there, they won't connect. And when I think about, and it requires a lot of resilience, Mary, and I think about the music sector uh, um, specifically, this industry is so close to communities just by design and by the charge. It is how you move people. Stories are being told through music. It's, a, it's an artful form, but that, that's, that adaptive piece of like, who are you serving and how do you know them? Like when that is the piece that needs to change, that's the pivot. It's as much as it comes from the top, it has to come from the right down to the last door that hands up that guitar. Like, what are you going to do with that? Why should I care? You know, and that's the change that we need. That you, it's the change that comes from the top, from the bottom, and actually creates an upswell all the way to the top. Um, the last thing that I want to add around this um, is, I was thinking about when, I think it was in June when there were Black Lives Matter movement, it kind of hit me when I was prepping for this conversation with Mary that none of the protests that have been have lacked music. There's always music, right? From the chants to the songs, it's a gatherer, it's a way of community, it's a way to, 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 to advocate. Music itself, the industry itself, is an agent for change and is an agent for advocacy. So how do we use all this channel that energy not only in a technical way, but in an adaptive way to accelerate the change that we want to see. Because music is at the core of change. Habib, thank you so much. Um, I want to end, end our segment with you with uh, uh, something that, again, John Lewis told us when he was with us in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. He said that it, if it wasn't for music, the civil rights movement would not have had the intensity or the energy that it had in it. And I also want to say something to all of our NAM members that are with us that, you know, that this starts with love. And there is such passion in our industry and such a support for one another in our industry. And then for all of our teachers, we know that you bring such commitment and love. Uh, and you know, I, I think that we've, and I look at all the NAM members that have every year come to Washington and they've been, they've put their collective uh, passion for music education into action with advocacy. So um, we, we are starting in some really remarkable and strong places as, a, as our own little micro community. And our conversation today uh, really uh, seeks to be a part of a new conversation where we can carry this forward. So Abib, you're gonna be sticking with us. And any final thoughts before we move on to our great swim folks? Looking forward to continuing the conversation. And thanks for Thanks for having me, Mary. Thank you, Abib. Uh, we're, we're grateful for your purpose and for sharing it with us. Well, we have a, a remarkable group of women that are going to be joining us with a project. This is, we call it, calling this a case study. Uh, what can happen by a group of committed, passionate, uh, organized individuals who uh, seek to address a need uh, relative to, to diversity and, inclu and, and inclusion. And that I'd like to invite Crystal Morris and Didi Hyde to join us. Uh, Crystal Morris, CEO of Gator Cases and Didi Hyde, Executive Vice President of Hyde Music in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, and Crystal is there in Tampa, so uh, welcome. Um, I think you're, you're helping us first, Crystal, with a little bit of background of SWIM, which is Smart Women in Music. Um, what was the problem did it seek to address and, and, and what did you do? Absolutely. Didi, will you want to take this one? I'd love to. So okay. um, thanks for having us today, Mary and Nam team. Um, so really, it started quite simply with the thought of that we need to grow 
the representation of women within the music products industry. And then building on that, not just to grow our representation of women within the music products industry, but how do we also, in the words of Kit Culpepper, level them up, right? Truly elevate the space for how we're developing leaders or helping to enhance the leadership that women are working on within our industry and make sure that we're very thoughtful and mindful on our pillars that we've created to connect, support, and grow. And I love, Mary, how you talked about the music products industry being that true big family. And it really is how we all come together to make that space for everyone. For us, we're working to close that gap, if you will, or maybe right be so bold to stop the gap that there is um, with not having women have that true equal representation and leadership. And that comes not just of checking the box, but creating the inclusion. And the more that we also all know and understand, as Habib also re referenced, right, having that diversity of thought is powerful. It creates change. It allows us the opportunity to create stronger organizations and truly a stronger community of what we'll have within the music products industry. If we all look, think, walk, talk the same, will be the same exact thing over and over, and that will not create the long-term space we need. So SWIM came to be through thoughtful conversations over the last decades of what Robin Walenta was really having at different things like the NAM show or at NASMD conferences. And it took us kind of being able to bounce on the opportunity of when she was the first chair um, in over a hundred years, um, at NAM, and we needed to be able to take that platform, create the legacy, and continue action. Not say we're going to worry about where we've been or point fingers, but say what do we want to create as the legacy and the opportunity going forward. So that's what SWIM's, SWIM's working on, and we're continuing to take that benchmark and make it better. And Dee Dee, I was in the room with at NASMD, which is for those of you not familiar, the National Association of School Music Dealers, at an event that it had in Miami. And you stood before a packed room, uh, standing room only, packed to the and uh, and used the words diversity and inclusion. And it was for a very very powerful moment. And I think everyone leaned forward into oh almost like, yes, we're, we are together going to address uh, this problem together. Uh, you created the platform for something. I think there was a, I think there was a desire, right? But there wasn't a, a sense of how do we get this done? So yeah. uh, any th thoughts of that, Didi? At that I moment? just would add on to that, Mary, that while it would have been um, conversations that have happened over periods of time and then Robin, Crystal, and myself sitting down in a boardroom in Chicago to work on a true plan of action and what we needed to be, it really couldn't have come to be without a large group of supporters. So truly the NAM Foundation believing in us and saying it's the time and NAM as an organization, awesome sponsors or donors, both from individual standpoints and organizations that said we need to make change and we, we're gonna invest, right? We're gonna invest together in making this happen and a great group of awesome volunteers that every day dig in and continue to share the message. So it really is a community saying we wanna make change happen. Yeah, I think at the moment, you know, it was like someone stood at the top of the hill, everyone was milling around and said, you know, we're gonna fix this. And everybody said, we'll go with you over the hill. It was um, those, those donors and those great, uh, it was really great. So uh, Crystal, tell us what's happening within the SWIM uh, project. Yeah, but absolutely. I'm so I think, you know, one of the things that um, I think that is, is coming up in all these conversations we're having is how do we get started? And so I, it seems like, you know, I'm so thrilled to see so many people participating today. Um, it's, there's so many people that really, this is top of mind and, but what do you do? How do you make a difference? And so, um, so Dee Dee Robin and I got together. Um, we kind of met, somehow we figured Chicago was semi middle ground and got in a room and we just really started and we spent two days hashing that out. And, um, and I just think that's kind of an important part of our story with SWIM um, because as other people are embarking on how do they be part of change and how do they change in their organization and industry and you know, the world, I think you, know, you have to get in a room and, and have the conversations and start creating a vision. And then the next piece from the vision is what do you actually do? So um, as- the the last said, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> wow, <laughs> thank you. Um, so as Didi said, we came up with three pillars. Um, and with those three pillars, the support and grow. Um, and we just started getting to work and thinking how to do it. So the first things we did is we started networking events at the NAMM shows. And um, I was blown away by the amount of people that came to these events and wanted to hear the message, hear what we were doing, and get to know each other and talk about how to, um, to be part of, of changing their organization. And then we've also launched a couple different series um, before the world of COVID um, of bringing scholarship women to the trade shows. And, and not only do we help them come, um, people that don't norm haven't normally been able to come, women in the industry that are, are on a journey in their career, but, um, but when they get there, we've, I believe, created a really great mentorship experience. So um, while they're at the show, they participate with all the different um, education that is going on. And then also we have teamed them up with other women leaders as mentors. They've done shadowing. So that's um, been a, a really great thing we've done, you know, obviously when the trade shows are happening. Um, and then we had our inaugural leadership summit in March. Um, somehow we literally got it in the week before I think all travel stopped. And um, we brought 16 amazing women um, to the NAM headquarters. And I have to tell you, it was um, honestly one of the most rewarding things I've participated in in so many years. It was three days um, of great training. Um, so, you know, really hitting our pillar of grow, but also to build these relationships and this network. And um, we, we did all sorts of things that were, were looking at leadership training and also really just building these women um, for their next step and really looking forward to being able to do that again. Um, so obviously, as have you mentioned, we're all pivoting and pivoting fast. And so now we are working on doing a virtual series and we're doing a couple different things with, um, with actually launching some very inclusive swim to get more people to join us um, virtual training and um, and then we're also doing some different things with some of the people that are already participating with swim with coaching groups to bring them together and to kind of continue their journey so those are a couple of the things we're working on right now we also have a podcast we have in the works and um, and really it's been great to do all of these different panels because it's just been amazing to me um, the conversation that gets started. And then, you know, um, lucky enough, I've been in the industry for a lot of years and my phone will ring and, and so many people will call me and say, hey, you know, well, I was looking around my organization and I really wish there was more diversity and I really want to focus on this. How can I get started? And so I really believe it's igniting a conversation. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Crystal, for all that you're doing in DD. And I wish Robin was here, but we know she's with us in spirit. But I want to turn to uh, two women who were part of the first uh, leadership event. Uh, that would be uh, Kit and Lisa. We'd love you to have you join us. Uh, and my question for both of you is, um, uh, I'd love to know what your perceptions um, about what your professional journey was before the swim experience and how it was transformative and, and, and what, was, what were some of the keys to helping you with that transformation? Kit, should we start with you and Martin Guitar? I would love to start and I may I just say how honored I am to be a guest panelist here and I just want to personally thank Dee Dee and Crystal and you Mary and Robin's not here but for inviting me and allowing me to be part of the inaugural summit. I'm just like all goose pimply right now to be able to speak about it. And I wish I had an hour because I have that much to say. But um, to, to answer your question, Mary, about kind of the before and after with the Swim Summit, um, being in this industry, I come from, um, you know, a pretty vast background working for the consumer packaged goods industry for 15 years before coming into MI. And I, I did find that, you know, it, it's a male dominated industry, like, wow, you know, so I joined and it was kind of like, Wow, starting over a little bit in the sense that I work with many female leaders and there was a great deal of diversity where I came from. Um, and so I was excited to see how I could add and how I could help empower. The SWIM Summit was about empowering one another, okay? And taking steps to optimize our own credibility. What could we do? What could we do? It wasn't about blaming, it was like, how do we empower ourselves and influence 
as leaders in our organization. So for me, it was important to share with our swim group. For me, it was like, hey, ladies, we already possess everything that it takes to grow into higher leadership roles. What we need to do is we need to develop our own awareness of our communication and behavior. And what we learned with the training that was provided is if we hone in on our strengths and we can clearly communicate, then we can influence and then we can start breaking through barriers. Okay. So for example, one of the topics we covered at SWIM as a group was how tactical many of our current jobs are. We're managers, we're directors, right? We're, we're, we're like right in the weeds with our teams, but sometimes being seen only in this capacity can lead us um, or can keep us from being considered for more strategic roles because all everybody sees is us, you know, being in the weeds. So we recognize that as a group, we need to be aware of opportunities to show off our strategic strengths in a meaningful way. And how we communicate was a major, major takeaway from SWIM. So that's, that's my part there. I mean, I could talk for a half an hour more, but yeah. that's how I feel. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, how about you? Your kind of perceptions of going in and, and uh, how the whole experience uh, has helped with your trajectory? Yeah, you know, and I, and I love to hear Kit talk about it. So there's a part of me that just wants to cede all my time to her because she gets me so back in the mindset of where we were and how excited to be part of this group. Um, I was like Kit, I came from outside of the industry. So coming into the industry was a little bit of a, a shocker as well in that MI has some, some room to grow in terms of dealing with gender diversity issues. And what I found is actually personally, I had allowed a little bit of competitiveness to like creep back into my mindset, viewing other women as maybe my competition. And the summit itself was just beautiful reset that put me back into an attitude of abundance and, and made me re-realize that there is room at the table for all of us and that we are supposed to be each other's greatest allies when it comes to both personal growth and professional advancement. So, you know, from that point, I just, I can't second and third what Kit said enough. But I also think specific to the summit, someone like me who's very shy, um, the, the summit allowed us to network in a way that was so deep and so meaningful. And if you think of the music industry as a family, like there's a little sub family within the family that we have who are women that are going to carry forward in my career, the whole, the rest of my career, you know, we lean on each other. We, we, uh, we reach out to each other. We take great pleasure in each other's successes. I see so many summit participants in the attendee list and that is empowering in a way that, that I can never thank Dee Dee and Crystal and Robin enough for creating. So we're kind of back to some of, to one of Habib's words, words, which is love. And I think from love, we can also go over to abundance, right? And the, you know, the gift that we are, we really can be each other's allies. And in that context, we also can have the uncomfortable conversations, right? I mean, it's all sort of cumulative. So I uh, guess to both you and Kit and Lisa, um, how did the summit sort of uh, translate into what are some of the, the themes that you're gonna carry forward as you no doubt will move into other opportunities in leadership? You know, we as professionals, we have certain themes, right? This, that we, we can define ourselves by. So uh, uh, maybe Kit, back to you. What are some of the themes that, uh, I think Lisa would mention abundance again, but Kit, mm -hmm. are there other themes that maybe you're- oh, there, there are some, some uh, many themes, but really what shouts out to me is, you know, Habib earlier said, you know, and you, Mary said, um, this takes work. I mean, it takes work. So, so my theme is you have to have an attitude and a mindset of talent development and support. And if you weave in what Habib said earlier, he said, I want to have a relationship with you. When you want to have a relationship with someone or a team of people, it takes effort. It does not just happen by itself. Okay. And Mary, you said, um, it's uncomfortable, right? Coaching is uncomfortable, but you need to be willing to get in there. Why? Because you care. When you care because you want more inclusion and because you want more diversity, you're okay with being uncomfortable. 
So you get in there. So my theme is an attitude and mindset of talent development and support. The professional, if people that know me hear me say this all the time, feedback, all feedback is a gift. And for me, in an environment of coaching and feedback, you're always going to get um, information. Sometimes the information that you get back is not what you want to hear. It could be critical, but nonetheless, isn't that information a perspective of someone else, not just your own? And so you get that kind of perspective. Oh, is that how that person sees me behaving? Right? So, so I want to also say that there are some very common barriers to equality and inclusion and diversity in the workplace. And there's a lack of female leaders. There's a lack of mentors, men and women. Um, some organizations have kind of no succession or talent development plan to build up diversity. Um, and also I've noticed in certain organizations, there's like a, you know, issues with respect, right? When you have a coaching environment or you create one for yourself, it naturally lends to a respectful environment because what you're saying to that person, like Habib said, I want to have a relationship with you. I care enough to let you know in that meeting, you kick butt. And I want you to know when you're in this focus, you shine like a star because this is your strength. So I want, and et cetera, et cetera. The coaching goes on and on and you guys get the gist of what I'm saying. But those are some tangible actions, you know, to model, you know, model, people model your behavior. If you're a leader and you're looking for more inclusion and teamwork and collaborative behavior, you need to be that person. And then you need to hold your team accountable to those behaviors so that, so that people observe and, and, and they go, oh, look at her. Human diversity is a way to cognitive diversity, okay? And then guess what happens? You get a more diverse workplace and then you get more cognitive diversity in the workplace. Kit, thank you so much. You know, I, I, want, to be, I, I want to flip it over to Lisa for her comments on this as well. But, um, you know, you, you reminded me in, in, your, in what you were saying is that some days it's not moving as fast as you want it to be. Some days it's, it's not the system, the system, the environment, the things that should be happening around us are not happening as, as fast as we know they could be or we want them to be. We want them to flip and twitch and be more active. But you know, that's when you have to uh, take it back. But I am being that vessel of change. I am moving the change forward and I am going to be kind, loving for a place of abundance. You know, but we know sometimes calling it like it is is also an act of love and, and an act of saying, you know, things have to change faster. But, you know, we have to, uh, I was just reminded of that. Lisa, your thought, how, what's themes uh, developed for you that you're going to be carrying forward um, as you develop as a, as a leader? Yeah, I, I think they're, they're very much on the same theme. And I think that for me, it's that you, it's not enough to hope that it will happen organically or to think that someone else will address this issue. I have to take personal responsibility and it, it, there's the action is you have to be deliberate. You have to expand your network and you have to use everyone in your network when opportunities arise to make sure that you're recruiting new voices onto the team. So I think for me, it's really about being proactive not only about sharing those opportunities within your network, but helping other people make connections to the people that you think they should know in order to grow and expand their horizons. Um, one of the things that came up at the Leadership Summit is that women aren't always great about self-promotion or networking. You know, sometimes we can be a little shy about speaking up on our own behalf, but we're great about advocating for each other. So an actionable step, you know, that I really try to take is to make sure that I step up and promote other people to the people that they should know, because that's how we bring more people to the table. Well, I can't thank you enough. And you all are, in, are, are indeed smart women in music. So whatever pool you came out of, I'm going to have what you're having. That's wonderful. So thank you so much. Now comes the really fun part of our gathering. And we're going a little over, but I, I, the very few people are leaving us. So we're, we're kind of a sticky event, and that's really good. Uh, our presenters are going to be joining us into a breakout rooms. Uh, we've just put into chat uh, a, a, a link to a Google Doc. It's uh, slides where you will court your, your breakout room will correspond with a slide like breakout room slide one, breakout room slide two. And simultaneously, you, you all can be taking, making notes on that document. 
So we'd love you to uh, select a moderator or someone can self-select. Some people are just natural and jump right in. Uh, have a note taker that can use the Google slide. And we post two questions that we'd love you to address. Um, and the, it, the first one is how can music or music or the music industry serve as a bridge builder to help advance conversations about diversity and inclusion among people with different backgrounds and points of view. And I'm talking, let's say, let's say you are a, 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 a company, a company that manufactures and distributes. Um, you are a music uh, entity. What could you do uh, for your employees or maybe even for uh, as a force for the community at large? And uh, the next one is an aspirational question. What are you doing or what do you hope to do within your organization to promote diversity, inclusion, and the opportunity for more people to uh, excel at their talents? And, and we know that when people excel at their talents, something happens to the organization itself the organization has a way of excelling and, and being more successful. So we're going to, uh, don't be afraid of this now. This all happens electronically. You don't have to go anywhere. You'll just zip into a breakout room with seven or eight people. We hope you do a round robin so you all can introduce each other. You can find your Google Doc and you can open your Google Doc right now on your own computer and find your slide and, and start taking notes if that's something you're into. And we'll come back in probably 10 or 12 minutes, so it's fast. Um, and then we'll ask you to report out. So go to breakouts. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I think everybody is coming back from their breakout groups. Um, I'm Claire Krieger-Boaz. I am a senior project manager at NAM and the NAM Foundation, and I'm going to be helping us wrap up here. I hope you had great conversations in your breakout groups. Um, I would love to uh, jump around. I, I'm looking at the slides here, and I see some groups have copious notes. Um, does anybody have something they would like to share from their breakout group? If you could just raise your hand or unmute yourself and start talking. Some sort of key points. We're looking for action points, takeaways. What can we all walk away from this meeting? And maybe there's one, two, or three things that each of us can then do in our workplace or community uh, that we learned from today. Does anybody want to go first or I'll call on you? Sure, I'll go first. Hi, Pamela. Um, so, I, and I'm not going to say it as well. I think Abby should say it again. She was in our group, but we need to write the music to make the change. So we can write the songs. I'm, a, I'm an elementary music educator, and I have to say that, that the youngest children, if, if they're hearing music and songs that are promoting these values and inclusiveness, um, then we're, we're, we're going to get there. But we, we can start with the youngest children. And so Abby can now say what she said so eloquently just a second ago. Let's, let's hear from you, Abby. Oh, you're muted, Abby. Hmm. Sorry, we go. got it. Um, all I was saying was that our sector has a skill that is unique to us and that's the music itself and the ability to create and share music and just what um, my cohort was sharing that we need to write the songs that are going to change the world we need to use our musical skills to create the music and share the music because it's such a powerful vehicle i love that that's really interesting starting young um uh, so, you know, some of us with younger kids, I think uh, if you talk to our kids, they they get it uh, much better than, than the adults do. Um, I am going to jump to my group really quick, group six. Um, Celia, if you um, could share from the International Music Council, I found it very interesting, um, your idea project and working with other organizations. If you could just share a little bit about that from a tactical standpoint. Yes, uh, thank you, Claire. Yes, um, we at the International Music Council, we're a global organization and we are partnering currently with uh, other cultural networks from other uh, disciplines to um, actually build our own um, capacity and, and that of our diverse leaderships to address issues of inclusion, diversity, equality and accessibility together to uh, the project is to uh, develop um, tools, uh, guidelines, um, toolkits for 
for ourselves and to learn from each other how we in each of our organizations are actually dealing with these issues. Um, this will be is at the risk of being a little bit top down. Uh, so the issue of buy in from our uh, respective members will be uh, will need to be addressed. And uh, I guess this is a nice um, transition to another organization mm -hmm. where actually this has come up from the membership uh, to the top of the organization. Joshua? Yeah, so um, I was happy to be with Claire as well. And uh, so I'm the executive director of the Percussive Art Society. And uh, we're actually going to be um, kind of leading up a discussion in October. So I hope people come for that. But we have a diversity alliance that started really with our members. It started with actually a lot of the women within the drum and percussion world who essentially for years and years and years have always uh, tried to get to their, their equal partners, uh, the men in, in the drum and percussion world. And finally, it, it kind of it bubbled up. And because of that growing from the membership coming to the executive committee, you know, and of course, the executive committee and board saying, yes, of course, it's something we should do. This diversity alliance was was created four years ago, and because of a you know a single marginalized uh, population, in which the diversity alliance you know says, they have now been able to expand that to you know uh, LGBTQA uh, race, uh, socioeconomic. So it started from one group of, of people, and from then to be able to kind of uh, uh, rise from there. So we're going to have members of our entire diversity alliance on a call in October. Um, as part of the NAM, these NAM great roundtables. So what I love about both of those examples is we have a top-down example um, in Celia's organization where she's reaching out to other, um, you know, executive level folks and and then um, is going to work together and then get buy-in from the membership. And at Progressive Arts Society, we have a membership bubbling up to a receptive and open executive committee. So I love that we have those two examples on the call. Thank you both so much. Do any of the other groups um, did anything stand out for you that you would like to share? We'd love to hear. I know we're running late, um, so if you need to jump off, that's fine. But um, I would really love to hear some of the other ideas that came up or takeaways. Gonna, Tony? Uh, good morning, Claire. Good to see you. Hi, Tony. You too. Uh, meetings this week. I just want to <laughs> e echo all things that we, we heard earlier. I mean, like from Habib saying about leading of love, um, being inclusive, and using our art form uh, as powerful as it is. Um, to inspire the communities um, and to use our artists who are up top who can help to, um, you know, when they're at the tables using their platforms um, to uh, understand about the importance of, of what it is, as we know during this time here, as we're, we're all now becoming more aware and more in tune about what is happening um, for all um, areas that needs to be addressed with, um, uh, with the various issues out uh, the racial gender etc um, but we know that music has been a very very powerful entity throughout our history throughout times and how they have brought our, our nation together and Tony you're at LA Unified correct right? right right and um, is there anything uh, any policies or anything specifically in place addressing diversity and inclusion um, you know, because we're such a large district and because we're all still dealing with the shutdown, you know, one of the things that we're doing, obviously, um, with our uh, with district policy is, you know, dealing with various cultural relations and, and different areas and just really allowing kids to bring in music that inspires them. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that we can learn from everybody and then we can also to have a greater appreciation and not to shut those doors. So it's not a general policy, but something that we're re reiterating with young teachers, uh, reiterating with our, our principals and et cetera, to be more acceptive and, um, and, and not just to go with the status quo, right? So that's what we want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to share from their group that stood out? Going once. Stephanie Lamont. Hi. Hi. I have, one, I have a quick yeah. little thing that we can end yeah. on. One thing that we just, at, right before we hopped out, we were talking about how, among other things, visibility is so important to show that there's a safe place for people and to celebrate diversity rather than just talk about how we can create more of it, like focus on it, celebrate it, lift it up. But Habib left us with the thought of how do we do that with trust? And that just like 
shook me to my core because mm. that is such an important, important thing to think of as we do this. So I think we're all working on that. How do we raise these stories? And us, Natalie and I with the podcast, like how do we, for swim, how do we make visibility, but in a way that doesn't feel exploitive, in a way that feels like it is truly celebrating in a, like a, a, a good like way with love. Everything we talk about, it starts with love. So that we can, we can end with that and be like, yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can do this. <laughs> I love it. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think that it would be wonderful to hear from our panelists uh, one more time, just some sort of, sort of parting thoughts. And I would, I would ask you to be as specific as you can. Uh, so if you could give us, give us a, a, a short to-do list. What do we do next? Be really, something that we're going to all write down and we're all going to walk away so, and, and, do one thing, whether it's, I'm going to, you know, you're going to go mentor someone or you're going to seek out a mentor or you're going to um, connect with the person that was in your group, uh, your breakout group, something that takes you out of your usual network um, and, and expands your, um, your pool of, um, as Kit says, cognitive diversity. Um, so, uh, Let's start, let's, let's kick through the, the swim group and we'll end with Habib. So um, I, let's start with Didi. Awesome. I think that um, taking away how Habib also said being your own chief equity officer, right? So I think finding your personal action because maybe sometimes how we feel we can institute change within an organization can seem overwhelming. Uh, but I think making your personal commitment to what that will be um, but I will say for me at Hyde Music, one thing that we're specifically working on is we realized we have a lot of work yet to do too on the landscape of education and understanding around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So how we're doing that is we're actually leaning in to thought leaders in our community that are very good in these spaces and asking them for help. So specifically, I serve on our local chamber board. And through that, Kimberly Clark, a large employer in our space, also said they're working on this. So I just leaned in and asked one of those leaders there, Shakla, to meet with our head of HR with me and say, help us to create actionable steps. So I just say, we're not where we need to be and we need to learn and creating bite-sized things that we do each month and, and continue to embrace in. So there are great spaces. I think just find where you're okay to raise your hand and say, we can be better and not feel Add about that. Yeah, I love you. that. Um, I don't know Here, if I'd like to go next. Oh, Kit, if, yes, please. That's okay. Um, and Didi, that was perfect. And I'd like to follow up with what Didi said to hijack something that Habib said in the very beginning, which is we feel a lot of anger and frustration when we notice that there isn't enough inclusion and diversity in our workplace. So, so what Habib said, so how do you channel that anger and frustration. And I go back to what we talked about earlier, which is what can you control? You can only control yourself, right? And so if you're empowered to do the right thing and you're that like poster child for it, people are gonna model your behavior because they're gonna see you as a leader. So that's what I wanna leave the group with. I love it. Lisa or Crystal, do you have anything you'd like to say as we wrap up? Um, yeah, I think the, the one thing that I would just add is, you know, we sometimes we talk about um, representation and leadership and, and making sure that, that the people, um, someone in my group said it, that the, the people on the stage match the people in the seats and, and vice versa. Um, but I also just want to emphasize how, like for me, how important I think the pipeline is and that it's important at, when you bring interns in, you know, and your entry level staff and your, your mid management staff that you, you can't let them maybe not get the same amount of focus and dedication in this process because that's how you build a strong industry and a diverse industry for years and years to come. I like that. And again, that, that, um, I think that goes back to the point that when we had rehearsal the other day, we were talking about um, you have to get out of your, your network. Otherwise, you're just going to keep going back to the same pool of people over and over again, and, and you won't get that um, diversity. And so I would challenge us all to, to do that, to get, let's find a way to get outside of your network. Jessica Barron, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to mention that the um, National Center for uh, Conflict Resolution is doing amazing mm -hmm. work on a grant right now, helping teams have 
this learned developed skills to learn to have the difficult conversation our charity um, has been very very involved in that process and we're still going forward with them and i'd recommend it for any of you that are working in groups that want to take the step they actually have a grant right now um, so some some of you may be able to access these services for free and i just wanted to let you know i'm putting that context in the chat if you want it that's amazing. Thank you. And I've, I've been on a couple of their webinars. They had, they actually had um, Ibram X. Kendi on um, a few weeks or maybe about a month ago. Uh, he wrote um, how to be an, an anti-racist and stamped from the beginning. And he is the uh, featured keynote headliner at um, Upswell <laughs> next month with Habib. So Jessica, thank you for bringing them up. They're an amazing organization. Um, Crystal, did you want to say anything? Thank you. Unfortunately, one of the there Oops, somebody's the need to us, mute somebody. And one of those got a little bit wet. <laughs> Let's see, whoever's, sorry that you had a spill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Crystal, do you, are, uh, maybe we lost her. Um, okay, well, Habib, take us out on a high note. All right, I'll try to make it high and positive since it's Friday. But um, I know a lot of um, the other panelists, by the way, I'm really honored. Um, to be in the space with you all, as well as not only the panelists, just everyone that's in here that is taking the time to um, start this journey or join this journey or continue the work that you're doing. So three things, I think I would build on what Stephanie said around trust, because as we think about diversifying staff, be it from the top at the board to bringing um, the entry level folks up or highlighting um, artists of color or all manufacturers of color, it would require trust and which means it requires investment in relationship. Like Claire and I, I won't be doing this if it didn't take us three years of you coming to my events and me coming to Anaheim. I was walking around like, why am I here? But I was here to see your work and see what you do. And that's why we're here. So it requires investment and it takes time. But I, I think you start now because if you don't start now, you'll still have to start at some point. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is just to get it clear, because I know Claire wants me to be very precise. I think it's getting closer, getting accountable, getting actionable, and let's get moving. Those are the four things. We are here already. This is it. That conversation is it. This is it. It's not something, it's not a framework. This is it. You just did it. We just did it. So let's get moving. Thank you, Habib. And thank all of you so much. Um, Bethany, if you could just throw up um, our, our slides. We have some programming coming up. This is the first in the series. This is, we kicked off music and social justice today with all of you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We have a whole series. Next week, we have a ukulele basic session um, on the 29th. And then we have, um, next slide, please. Um, we're doing a back to school access and equity in online learning next week. And for our Anaheim folks that are on, um, Superintendent Christopher Downing will be on. Um, we have Sarah Womack from Baltimore um, Unified School District and um, Shelby, I forgot his last name, from Florida uh, State University. It's going to be um, uh, great programming and I hope Um, these are our, um, how to talk to your administrators about why music ed still matters. This is geared really specifically toward K through 12. Uh, and then the next in the series of music and social, oh, can you go back one? Music and social justice features uh, percussive art society as a case study in creating diversity and inclusion. I'll change this Joshua from committee to alliance, uh, taking your note there. Um, and then we have uh, Gen X Careers in Music students speak out. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for some or all of that. Um, and please, uh, next slide, please. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, we have Believe in Music Week in January. If you'd like to sign up to receive updates about that, you can go to Believe in Music TV and sign up. We hope that you um, got something out of today's event. This was our first go at this. So, um, I'm open to feedback. My email is claireK at nam.org. 
I am uh, project managing this series and would love to hear what you thought worked well and what you'd like to see in upcoming sessions. Thank you all so much for all of the work you're doing. I admire all of you. I love the specifics we came away with as well as the, as the philosophical idea of love and trust. And um, I agree with Habib, we did, we did something today and I think it'll take a little time to digest exactly what it is, but thank you. <laughs> Make sure you sign up for Upswell, upswell.org. They're doing incredible work in this space um, and have amazing speakers. And I admire and adore and love and trust you all. And until we see each other again, have a wonderful day and a great weekend. Thank you.